Yeah, the people oh, over there. Some others are. Yeah. Uh, I guess she was blocking. No, you didn't do anything? No, it just I came on. I started the meeting again. I closed everything. Yes, that's what I, uh, that's what was necessary. Yeah. Sorry, there was an initial niche, a glitch. Um, uh, I think we're okay. Okay, so um, we can start the class. But let me start by. Um, welcoming you and uh, those who haven't been here before. And uh, are there any questions? Um, not private questions, but questions that deal with the course, what I said last time, uh, those kinds of matters. Okay, just um, we can, it may become impossible and so on, but we can sort of allow, um, if people have interventions, of course the chat function is important, but um, the uh, you can also sort of um, uh, intrude and uh, uh, ask your question or make your comment. And we can proceed on that basis on the, if everything is okay. So are there any, again, I'll ask, are there any questions stemming from last time? So last, uh, so today what I propose to do is sort of finish off my remarks from last time relatively uh, quickly. And then uh, uh, go through the syllabus in a thorough way so that you clearly understand uh, what is required you, uh, of you in this class. And you, you'll uh, note that I sent you an email explaining that everything is being recorded and is available on YouTube, all of these lectures, so that uh, that provides you with a backup, um, including um, the review questions, which I alluded to last time. and which I'll mention again this time. Are there any questions about what I've said? Okay. Um, so last time what I did was I gave you, I tried to give you an overview of what the course was all about. Um, and um, very quickly, yeah, of course, it deals with the whole period from 1500 to 1800. And um, it starts with uh, sort of, uh, we're dealing with, of course, uh, uh, the world, the world civilization, world uh, history. And in 1500, uh, really, the contacts between the different parts of the world are re relatively limited. Um, and there is a rough, uh, well, um, let's assume that Columbus comes along in 1492, but say we're, we're still dealing in 1500 with the reality that the Americas are just barely becoming uh, understood. Uh, they're separate. Uh, the main theater is Eurasia and Africa. Um, uh, and uh, in that respect, um, we're dealing with uh, uh, Europe. Uh, we're, we're in particular concerns about Western Europe where capitalism gets started, but we have to be uh, also aware of Eastern Europe and Russia. Uh, we're dealing with um, um, the Middle East, there it's the Ottoman Empire, which is dominant. In India, it's the so-called Mughal Empire, the Mughal Empire, which has just come to power in India and controls two thirds of the Indian subcontinent. There is China, which is perhaps the greatest of the civilizations 
that existed around 1500. And then in Africa, there are in places like uh, Mali and Zimbabwe, there are veritable uh, civil law civilizations in those places with um, many, if not most, of the characteristics. And I would say that overall in 1500, again, I'm stressing the dates, these, stay, these uh, civilizations are in a rough equilibrium with one another. No one is dominant. And in fact, uh, there are, of course, uh, some contacts, but they're quite limited. And what we see progressively between 1500 and 1800 is, of course, uh, a much greater degree of contact. But the, the main thrust of things is the emergence of Western Europe uh, based on a new mode of production, capitalism, uh, becoming stronger and stronger, both internally and in terms of overseas. And successively, as a result of that, um, through the centuries that we're dealing with, uh, first in the 16th century, they simply take over Latin America, the Spanish and the Portuguese conquest of Latin America. But then in the 18th century, by the 18th century, in the course of the 18th century, you see that these West European capitalists are able to sort of uh, begin to subject the whole of the Middle East under the Ottoman Empire to their control. Likewise, the British have conquered India by 1800. And even China by 1800 is um, reeling in the face of the growing penetration of Western influence based on the strength of capitalism. And when I say capitalism, um, the capitalism is expressing itself above all through the emergence of these, well, these powerful market economies, but also state structures, the English state, the French state, uh, the, the uh, Dutch state, these powerful state structures and the military apparatus, the military technology, which accompanies all of this. And of course, uh, all, uh, all the while this is happening, of course, you have what we call capital accumulation, uh, economic growth, to put it most simply, maybe crudely. Any questions about what I've said? This is the overview. Uh, okay. Who was it you, who was it you said went to the uh, Central America? You said uh, Spain and who? Portugal. Spain and Portugal. Portugal. Does anybody know what part of Latin America Portugal conquered? Brazil. Exactly. Brazil is today is a Portuguese speaking country. And for centuries, really until the 19th century, it was under the control of the Portuguese. So there is the thrust of capitalism, capital state, uh, and uh, the uh, military technology, which is uh, the overall explanation for this. And of course, so by 1800, the Europeans are really beginning to um, uh, completely disrupt the original equilibrium. Um, but it's also uh, important to note that the fundamental reason why uh, these uh, traditional empires, Chinese, Mughal, Ottoman, uh, and the ones in Latin America, the, the um, Aztecs and Incas, uh, why they were not able to resist the Europeans was um, not simply because of capitalism and its um, various elements, but because um, in fact, in these societies that we are going to be looking at, and this is an important aspect of the class, 
uh, we're not we're not simply going to spend our time looking at the Europeans. We're going to look at the non-European peoples and their cultures and societies. Uh, but we can say that we shouldn't romanticize what was going on in these societies. Uh, uh, there were fundamental weaknesses that they had, which made it possible for the Europeans to predominate. Uh, there okay. was a certain over-exploitation by the elites in these society over the ordinary people, the peasants, the craftsmen, uh, the taxes and rents that they had to pay to landlords, to the state were excessive. Secondly, there was a there was this huge gap as a partly as a, as a result. Uh, inequality uh, in these societies, uh, the lack of a rapport between the bottom and the top of these societies. Um, the ordinary peasant in some ways was indifferent uh, to the um, ambitions of the Europeans and because their masters, their native masters, uh, didn't care about them. Thirdly, there were uh, these um, societies were dominated by what we can call traditionalist ideologies, in particular religion, but so, uh, well, in the case of uh, the Middle East or India, religion, but in the case of say China, it was a traditional philosophy known as Confucianism. Um, and meanwhile, the Europeans had invented modern philosophy and science, rationalism, scientific revolution uh, with accompanying technology. Um, and finally, we can say that in, in many, if not most of the societies which were becoming vulnerable to the Europeans, um, the elites uh, and indeed the peoples were divided between themselves. As you'll see, they couldn't get it together politically um, and socially. And so there were these rivalries in the society which made it easier for the Europeans to divide and conquer. So, um, does anybody have any questions about um, what I said? Okay. Um, now, so I said this has had by 1800 or 1810, 1820s, probably we're going to where we're going to end up with this narrative. But we should note that. This was only the prelude because, of course, in the course of the next century, by the by the year, say, 1900, we're ending off around 1800. A hundred years later, these same Europeans and the United States, I'm talking about England, France, Germany, Belgium, Holland, the United States of America, had all basically colonized or nearly colonized most of the traditional societies that we're talking about. The global South, the third world, fell directly politically under the control of these West European states. Um, and of course, we're living in part in the aftermath of all of these events. Now, I the main thrust of what I've been saying is that capitalism is responsible. This fantastic system whose, of course, uh, singular characteristic is, of course, economic growth. Uh, but it had, uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, an important accompaniment of it was the development of the territorial state. I've mentioned some of them, England, France, Germany, Belgium, uh, um, Holland, the United States. And this territorial state proved to be very important because uh, it um, allowed 
for the organization of economic markets within these states, um, which um, also allowed uh, especially the control over the labor force in these various countries. At the same time, externally, the state became the chief, chief means, the state which was constantly perfecting the means of warfare became the means by which the Europeans were able to conquer, colonize and conquer the rest of the world. So the state will play a very important role. And of course, when I speak about capitalism, um, uh, there was a certain class in society which directed the development of the new capitalist and very powerful capitalist uh, um, society. Can anybody tell me what was the name of that class? Uh, there is capitalism, but who controls capitalism? Who controls it? Anybody? Jack, what do you think? Uh, not the aristocracy? The aristocracy? No, it's the middle class. The middle class in society. Now this class, when we talk about the middle class, we all very often hear, particularly in the kind of public propaganda that you get, oh, we're all middle class. This is nonsense, complete rubbish. No, there is a, a certain element which appeared in the 16th century, a certain maybe 10 or 15% of society who were the entrepreneurs. There was of course an aristocracy that these are the people who made war and so on and were landlords. But below them, there appeared this new class, the class of the, the middle class in society. The rest of society were peasants uh, and were ultimately being, going to be transformed into workers. It's the middle class, which is a decisive class in the development of capitalism and continue to be so. Now this middle class um, were rough and ready people. Uh, uh, this was no gentleman's club here. Um, society was filled with violence. Uh, the market itself was virtually uh, in a constant state of war. So in order to be a successful businessman, you had to be rough and ready. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, the rise of the middle class is marked by a series of violent shocks. Um, the middle class uh, were pushing a lot of little people down, but they were also pushing upwards against uh, the old ruling class, namely the aristocracy. Uh, they wanted to push them aside. And ultimately, they did in the most advanced capitalist countries, the middle class using violent means took power by revolution. Revolution and capitalism go hand in hand. The first great middle class revolution in, occurred in Holland in 1576, 1576. Holland, which was the, one of the most, well, it was a remarkable early capitalist country. The second bourgeois revolution occurred in England in 1642. Indeed, they chopped off the head of the king and established a republic for a few years. Finally, the last and the greatest of these revolutions was the French Revolution of 1789. Now, why revolution? Because um, what, what revolution was all about was basically taking over the power of the state by the middle class. The original power was vested precisely in the landed aristocracy. These revolutions that I'm speaking about see the seizure of state power by the middle class. And why is that? Uh, why do they want to do that? 
because the middle class at a certain point reaches a certain point of maturity, power and strength, particularly based on its economic wealth, which demands that the state itself be reorganized in order uh, for capitalism to further develop. In other words, the further development and expansion of capitalist power me, uh, requires the reorganization of society itself in order to um, sort of transform it in a way which is conducive to the development of capital. So I've explained more or less what um, uh, this, uh, the overall thrust of the class that we are conducting. Does anybody have any questions or comments about what I said? Now, at the end of uh, the, the lecture I gave last time, I said something really dramatic. I said, this system, which, as I said, is in the course of uh, this uh, narrative and uh, by extension um, into the 19th and 20th century, conquers the world. I'm saying that this system is coming to an its its, its term, its end, its ending, and it's ending because we have entered. Um, a, a deep crisis. It began at the beginning of the new millennium, but it's intensified in the last 20 years between 2000 and 2022, and it's become ex, uh, more and more serious. Uh, and of course, it's marked by economic crisis and so on. I can't get into all of the details. I'm not going to get into them. But I'm saying that certainly, I would argue that even the COVID crisis that we are going through and so on is a symptom of the crisis of this system because it doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from the deep uh, disturbance of the physical environment, the natural environment by the intrusion of the forces of massive economic change, which is basically uh, stirred up um, a whole sort of set of diseases, including Ebo Ebola and all kinds of different viruses that are at work. And we are the, uh, in the consequence of this. And of course, as I was saying last time, I talked about the looming clouds of war, the looming clouds of war. Um, I know I have to get to the syllabus and I will get to the syllabus. Hold on. But um, the, um, you have to know my mind, you have to know my thoughts in order to sort of appreciate where I'm coming from and because history is not neutral, forget about it. Uh, no, um, there, everybody who does history, everybody who studies history understands that uh, history, uh, the way we understand history is, is deeply shaped by not simply the facts of the past, but the reality of the present. So uh, in terms of um, the ultimate expression of the crisis we're in is the looming threat of war, the looming threat of war. And of course, what I'm referring to is the Ukraine, but I'm also referring, of course, to the looming threat in East Asia, uh, the Chinese versus the United States. And what I think, and these are my thoughts, is that the United States and its friends, including Canada, are responsible for the clouds of war. Indeed, uh, they, the elites in these uh, in uh, these governments, including the Canadian government, are interested in a. They want a war that they can control, but they want a war. And why is that? Well, we the easy the easy answer is because of the military-industrial complex. People are making money 
huge dollars are being made in the capitalist economy through war. But the, 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 the singular thing is that there are so little other opportunities available to these elites in the society that we live to make money. And part of the reason for this is the fact that um, the rise of China and the, raw, and the re-emergence of Eurasia, China, the Silk Road, Eurasia, stretching all the way to Germany, the most powerful country in Western Europe. And what is so notable at the present moment is the United States, the UK, Canada, the white Anglo-Saxon powers, the powers that emerged after, in the course of the 16th, 17th, 18th century, as the predominant powers in the world, these are the powers that are beating the war drum. But we know that, Ger well, Germany is not interested. Germany is not interested. Germany, the greatest economic power in Europe is not interested. And why is that? Because it knows, it already is a fact that its market in Russia and in China is already greater than uh, anything that the United States has to offer. So what I'm saying is that um, at the beginning of this course, at the beginning of this course, Eurasia is in an equilibrium. And as a matter of fact, China is the, uh, if we have to pick, it would be China, which is the most important of the, of the civilizations that we're talking about. And what we see after 1500 is the rise of Western Europe, the rise of the Atlantic powers, the rise of the powers that dominate the oceans. And what we see today is a striking new development. Based on the leadership of China, we're seeing the reemergence of Eurasia, the Eurasian continent, stretching off from Berlin to Beijing as is emerging as a new center of the world. And the United States of America and its friends, including Canada, do not like this. And, but the problem is they cannot compete economically. And so they are beating the drums of war. Let me end by noting, to give you an, an example, a dramatic example of this is look at Latin America which uh, has historically been dominated by the Spanish and the Portuguese, then came the British, and then in the modern period since the 19th century until through the 20th century, the United States of America, Latin America was the backyard of the United States of America. The United States completely controlled Latin America. What is the situation today? look at the 22 republics of Latin America. Who is the greatest trading partner of um, all of these countries now? It is not the United States of America. It is China. China extends its reach over Eurasia. China extends its reach into Latin America. Uh, this is why we have these so serious, uh, so serious international tensions that we have today. And so um, with all that being said, I turn now, unless people have something else to say, Brett, I turn now seriously to the syllabus. And I would, what you need to do now is get your, uh, the, the syllabus all out because I'm now going to go into a detailed discussion of the elements of the syllabus. Let's go back to the first page. So uh, syllabus, I already went over the first uh, uh, course description and so on and noted uh, the fact that all of the what we're doing is on Zoom and will be to the end of the term. Uh, I'll try to use as many illustrations and maps as I can. Uh, it's difficult and so on, but 
Uh, I'll try my best. You'll have to bear with me. I'm not a tech, a techie, uh, but I'll try to illustrate things because in history, it's important to have a graphic and a vivid sense of, uh, if you can, of what we're talking about. And of course, I've already mentioned that all these lectures are backed up. They're all going to be on YouTube. Um, so uh, with the next uh, item, we come to the textbooks. And I've noted uh, there are three. There is uh, the basic sort of outline of the narrative that I am offering is reiterated in a different form by this book by Robert Marx, The Origins of the Modern World. And as you can see, if we go down a few pages, in the syllabus, Um, I believe there is, there is um, reading assignments from, I can't find it in this, um, in this scroll, but there is in, there should be in the syllabus, um, a set of readings from Marx, page by page. I could see somehow it didn't get included. I will provide you with that. Um, the reading assignments from, um, Marx, week by week, it breaks down what pages in the textbook you should be reading. Now, um, uh, Professor, I think you just have to keep on going down. It's under the page. It's, it's sure. further down, is it? Yeah, I believe it's further down there. Okay, so we're, we're not, I'm not going to bother with it, but further down in the syllabus, you'll find the weekly assignments, uh, which is uh, what I, the, the main reason I give you this is to give you a sort of something that you can depend on in terms of a, a sort of a, a reference. So that's, that's, uh, that's in there. So thank you for intruding in that way. It's helpful. Um, so then, then there is the, um, Uh, in addition, there are these two books, one by myself and one by uh, Kumar Bhagshi, who is a, an Indian historian about um, the, um, basically the development of capitalism. And uh, the, these two books are important in terms of doing the essays in this course. Uh, the next item basically gives you um, how the, the course is graded. Uh, usually, well, uh, well, I do use a quantitative number. I use numbers, and uh, they uh, you can see how they translate. If I give you a number like 90, you know that you've got an A plus in, uh, in a, a given assignment, and so on. And the dates uh, are given. Okay, so first of all, I wanna say there are these four pieces of work in, in, the, in this class. Um, let's deal with the last first, namely the final exam. The final exam is worth 30% of, uh, of the class and uh, the final, final exam covers all the material in the, uh, in the lectures and the reading um, in the form of a set of a set of review questions. Oh, uh, here I've come to the reading schedule. 
from Marx. And here are the review questions at the very end of the syllabus. Now, what I've done basically is in, in order for you to sort of, there's a lot of material in this course. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big narrative. And of course, there's also Marx. So what I've done is, is I've brought up a list of key 31 key questions. And the course of uh, these um, sessions that I have with you online, as we come to them, I will answer, I will set up for you what I consider to be a, um, a decent answer to the uh, to these separate this, these questions. For example, the first question is what are the characteristics of a civilization? Enumerate the civilizations flourishing in 1500. Now what I'm saying is that the final exam will consist of nine questions which are drawn from these very review questions. These questions will appear these are the final exam questions. I will make a, simply a choice of nine. I will divide the exam up into three parts, the beginning part, the middle part, and the end part. I will take three questions from each part to a total of nine questions. And you will answer um, three questions in a take-home exam. And as I say, I will, as we come along to these different topics, I will review these questions. And the, 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 my answers, of course, are going to be on Zoom, are going to be on YouTube, because it's all recorded. So you have to pay attention to this and refer back in terms of your study for the final exam, but you can see if you do pay attention, it enormously simplifies the task that you have in front of you. Other, and this is 30% of the class. Does anybody um, have any questions about what I've said? I have a, one question. Um, I have about a book for the question. Is that fine with that? What's that? I have a question about the textbooks. Is that a fine with you? You have a question about what? That textbook. I have a fourth about edition the for the. Yeah, I have a fourth edition for the modern history. Is that fine with it? It's a uh, third edition for the syllabus. Well, what's the problem? You can't get it. Well, um, I have the fourth one. If it's fine with the fourth one, it's you know I don't want to buy a third one. Well, you you probably have to buy it. Okay, right, no, that'll be fine then. I just I just gonna buy it then. Yes. Thank you. This is a kind of a private question. You don't want to sort of spend time on this. Um. So that deals with the um, the. Um, the review questions, the final exam, and so on. But now we come to the uh, the rest of the credits in the class, 70% of the class. And this consists of basically developing a term essay. Because in the history department and in the University of Manitoba, the writing of a good essay, the ability to put together a decent essay is regarded as fundamental literacy. It's fundamental literacy. The skills required, the analytical skills, the compositional skills of producing, these are not long essays. If you look at the word counts, they're quite small. Um, a series of small, uh, well, preliminary work, uh, first draft, and final essays through a series of stages. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, this um, 
essay that you will produce should be a fully polished piece of work. And you will be getting, the, because I will have uh, some support, you will be giving, you will be, be given feedback on your work. Uh, you will be given resources to try and help you to put together a successful essay. And as I say, the essay has three parts to it. And the, I'm not gonna uh, go into the second and third part because we really don't uh, have the time today to do that. Uh, but the, I just wanna deal with the third, well, I, first of all, I wanna say, so this is the 70%. Um, the first um, part of it is 15%. Um, and then successively, uh, the rest of the essay. Now, the first part is really Mickey Mouse. We're talking about high school work here. It's very simple. Why is it simple? Well, it's simple in appearance, it's simple. Because it asks a series of questions which you are to answer. Uh, it's, this is the raw material out of which you're going to actually begin to, to compose a real essay, which begins to emerge in the, uh, in the second part of this um, assignment. And so the first part basically asks things like, what is capitalism? What is feudalism? Um, um, capitalism and revolution are closely explained, are closely related, explained. There's, all, there's a series of 11 questions which you must answer. Now, I've made it as easy as possible because the way to answer it is to go to my book and to go basically to Bakshi's book. I give the pages where the answers are to be found. And you are to write out, out uh, an answer to all of these 11 questions. At the same time, you should understand that the concepts I'm asking you to describe and the sort of, uh, sort of uh, debates between historians and other scholars about, uh, say, the, um, the um, um, say, the uh, conflicts between Harmon, Brenner, and Heller, et cetera, that are described these are intellectually, they're challenging. You have to sort of really think it out. So it's not simply Mickey Mouse high school stuff. No, there are important issues and theories that lie behind these questions. So that is the, uh, basically the first assignment. And then successively out of that and with some additions, you see, uh, you produce a first draft, which as I say is due on the 4th of March. And you will receive feedback on both of these uh, leading up to a final finished version of this essay, which should be as perfect as you possibly can make. It. And if you do that and you are able to produce a perfect first year essay, you can successfully do uh, university level work right through your, your university career and beyond. That's the purpose of this kind of an assignment. So um, this altogether is worth 70% of the um, grade that you will receive in this class. Are there any questions about what I've said? So then there is, as we go through the syllabus, there's a discussion of late work. We're very liberal in sort of making allowances. So we, we're, we're living in, Weird times, 
and uh, everybody has their weird, weird little life in under these circumstances. And so we have to adjust ourselves. And I am going to try and adjust my, myself to your needs as much as possible. But you have to let us know where you're at. And it's important not to fall away and to give up. No, if you're having trouble and so on, you want to contact me. Uh, and furthermore, uh, there are all sorts of other um, uh, 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 possibilities within the university structure that you can consult. Now, uh, there's now this rubric, I see academic dishonesty. Well, I can tell you that the history department is fanatic about plagiarism. Everything is, of course, going to be uploaded. Your assignments are all going to be uploaded. Well, they're going to be checked. Um, they have big machines. They there are companies that specialize in tracing plagiarism. And so uh, the penalties are significant. And I advise you to get it. Uh, just do your work. That's the best way through. Now, in terms of student resources, what we're, um, I think I'll break off at this point and briefly pick, pick up a discussion of the uh, syllabus, but then get on to the narrative in the next class. Thank you for your patience, and we'll see you in the next class.